You know, in the midst of our disconnection, we, we've got all kinds of ways of coping that work for us. Uh, many, many that I work with are busy. Uh, and, and if I ask what's going on, what's wrong, uh, they'll say, well, nothing's wrong. I've got a great job. I've got a great spouse. I've got two kids. I've got, uh, and, and yet I'm depressed. And yet, you know, I continue to have stomach pain and heart burn and IBS issues and, and I don't sleep at night and, you know, all the kinds of things that we hear in this work. And so, you know, I, I do think that, uh, it takes a while for people to begin to get this sense that, oh no, that I'm made for so much more. I just don't know it. I, I thought this was it. I thought life on the hamster wheel was it, and it's not it. Chuck, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to meet you. We've been chatting for a few minutes, and I knew at the outset this was going to be a great conversation today. So, so glad to meet you. Yeah, so glad to meet you too, Chris. Yeah, we're going to dive in underneath the hood folks you know this is part and parcel of win today and i'm so excited chuck that you're here today because i think you're going to help us get under the hood of the issues that keep us stuck and encumbered and disconnected um, from the best version of who we've been designed to be by almighty god i want to start here though chuck and it's perhaps a little uh, quick to the punchline but we'll we'll back our way out of it and it's this why don't people change you know, as I, as I canvas culture today, I talk to so many people who are saying, I am so stuck. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm on the hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And so many people are stuck in cycles of pain, blame, and addiction. Why don't yeah. people change? Yeah, such a good question. You and I were comparing notes beforehand, and we've got a mutual <laughs> friend named Allison Cook. Yeah, and we were wrestling Allison. with a version of this question in a conversation the other day, and you know, at least part of it, I think, is we were we were talking, uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts because uh, you and I, you and you and I are both engaged in this work, right? But there, there's a sense that we're habituated to disconnection, right? We live disconnected lives, uh, and we don't realize we're disconnected. And you know, in the midst of our disconnection, we we've got all kinds of ways of coping that work for us. Uh, many many that I work with are busy, uh, and and if I ask what's going on, what's wrong, uh, they'll say, well, nothing's wrong. I've got a great job. I've got a great spouse. I've got two kids. I've got, uh, and, and yet I'm depressed. And yet, you know, I continue to have stomach pain and heart burn and IBS issues. And, and I don't sleep at night and, you know, all the kinds of things that we hear in this work. And so, you know, I, I do think that, uh, it takes a while for people to begin to get this sense that, Oh no, that I'm made for so much more. I just don't know it. I, I thought this was it. I thought life on the hamster wheel was it, and it's not it. I want to go right to that phrase, habituated to disconnection. Let's break that apart a little bit. Number one, how do we get habituated? And then define for me disconnection. I, I want to dive deeply into disconnection from the yeah. content of your work, and we will do that. But let's just kind of spend a little more time on habituated to disconnection. For folks that might not track with that language, what are we talking yeah. about? Yeah, well, we can talk about this from, from a number of different angles, right? So I'm a, I'm a therapist, but I'm, I was also a pastor for a number of years, and I teach uh, counseling and Christian spirituality at a seminary. So I'm always thinking with you know different parts of my brain, and this idea of of being habituated to disconnection is is really an ancient way of talking about our predicament that we uh, we live uh, in in disconnection from God, right? We live in disorder is is a word that often comes up throughout the Christian tradition, and uh, there's an early theologian that uh, listeners may have heard of Saint. St. Augustine, St. Augustine, who, uh, who said that we're living apart from God while God is at home within us. And I like that, the sense that God is always at home. Uh, when I was young, I thought that God was far, far away, and I had to sort of climb the ladder to God. But Augustine said God is already within. It's we who've gone away. And so on, on, the, on the one hand, from the point of view of Christian spirituality, uh, we are living apart from God. Uh, we're chasing after, I often say it this way, we're chasing after uh, our God-given inheritance of worth, belonging, and purpose in other places. Uh, so that's part one. Uh, let me just hit pause there if you want to follow up on that. I can, I can give you a part two in a second. 
Well, do you want to? Yeah, do you want you want to dive in? I I've got so many thoughts about this already. It makes me think of even Rollheiser's quote from his iconic book, The Shattered Lantern, that God is always present to us, but we're not always present yeah. to God. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, you'll hear this from a number of different places and throughout the Christian tradition that God is at home and we are away. And I, I think I think it goes back to that primal story, you know, that story that uh, we're told as kids if we grow up in the church of Adam and Eve being tempted by the serpent and chasing after the fruit and finding themselves east of Eden. And we're living east of Eden now. And the, and the, and the interesting piece of this, the part two of this, that I find fascinating as a therapist is that this sense of con- disconnection is also um, emotional and somatic, which is to say uh, we, feel it, we feel it in our bodies and in our emotions. Uh, our our autonomic nervous systems were designed to help us do two things, to survive uh, dangerous animals and dangerous uh, predicaments in life and to connect. And, and the reality is, is that uh, when we're born into this world, we're, we're born into a world that is imperfect, right? We're born to imperfect parents. And each and every one of us, no one is immune to this. Uh, if you have a nervous system, you're not immune to this. Each and every one of us is uh, finds ourselves in survival mode. And I will meet people, Chris, I, I work with all kinds of people, but I'll often meet pastors, you know, the very people who are guiding, uh, you know, guiding people into deeper relationships with Jesus and, and stewarding the church. And, and, and they'll, They'll tell me they're tired and they need uh, they need more rest and they're overwhelmed and they need more connection with God and and we'll sort of break this down and what we'll discover is that they too are on this hamster wheel what I call this sympathetic nervous system hamster wheel that they're in survival mode that that something about their lives from very early on um, has created the conditions for them to uh, uh, to to sort of keep busy and merely sort of survive life and not really thrive. And uh, the reality is, is that there, there's so much more available to us, both spiritually and, you might say, somatically. We were made to connect. We were made to thrive. Uh, our nervous systems uh, don't, uh, uh, I'd say our bodies don't prefer to live in survival mode. Uh, it takes a toll and it creates illness in our bodies and disconnection in, within and in our relationships. And so... Uh, the hope, and I write about this, is that we can shift our state from this anxious embodied state, this state of what I call sympathetic storm, um, to the still waters of God, to this place of connection, delight, um, and love. Moments ago, you were talking about how we often chase things that are already ours by inheritance. I'm fascinated by this. What happens somatically in the nervous system yeah. to our mental and emotional health and to use biblical language from like the book of Proverbs what happens to the state of our human spirit when we chase and work for things that are already ours by yeah. the, by the fact of inheritance and the finished work of Jesus yeah what happens yeah well so uh, just to back up a bit the reason I say that is because uh, we are image bearers we're created in the image of, of God which is to say our birthright is at least three things and and back in the day, I was going to do a PhD in biblical studies, so I was into this sort of stuff. These three things are worth, that were designed for dignity. Uh, secondly, belonging, that were made in and for love. Uh, and third, purpose, that we matter. Uh, and we could break down each one of those things. There, there, there's deep sort of biblical wisdom around each of these, but we're created for worth, belonging, and purpose. Now, the reality is, is that... Uh, we're two chapters into the story of the Bible and a serpent comes along uh-huh. and whispers, did God really say that? You know, did God really, wow. I, I think there's something else available to you. And, and we hear that voice as well. We have a mutual friend named Kurt Thompson and Kurt says that, you know, shame enters the picture even here. We don't have to wait until Adam and Eve are east of Eden. There's this initial voice that uh, makes us, prompts us with the question, am I enough? Uh, is God enough? Is God good? Can I trust God? Can I trust that I'm I'm made for worth and belonging and purpose? And that story is our uh, the story we're living in today as well. Um, Adam and Eve chase after the fruit. 
we chase after the fruit too. And in the midst of this state of alienation that we live in, the state of disconnection that we live in, there's a sense that we don't trust that it's already ours, that God is already more, as Augustine says, more near to us than we are to ourselves, that worth and belonging and purpose is already ours. Uh, we have this sense that, no, I've got to find it. I've got to find it in performance and productivity and all the different kinds of things we run to uh, for those things. What is yeah. it about shame? Like, why? I wonder why Scripture didn't label them as naked and carefree. Naked and happy. Yeah. The scripture says they were naked and unashamed. What is so devious about shame and so primitive about shame? Yeah. Well, we've been using the language of disconnection, and, and shame really can be defined as as lived disconnection, right? And you know, in in shame, there is that sense that something's missing. You know, that we're deficient. You know, you talk to someone who has a palpable experience of shame, and I've known a lot of shame in my own life over the years, you know, there's a sense that I'm not enough. And that's, that's the whisper. This is why I think it's brilliant. Kurt, Kurt may have been the first, I've chased this down in other places too, where others have said, you know, that, that whisper of the, that slithering serpent, you know, that, that question of, did God really say uh, that you can't eat of that tree? That did God really say you, you have to listen very carefully. Like, did God really say like, can you really trust God? Can you really trust God's design for you? And with that question is that first inkling of not enoughness, you know, and shame. You know, so so do I think that the writer of Genesis was a psychologist? N not necessarily, but I think what the writer of Genesis was getting at is that there's this sort of primal sense of disconnection, of not enoughness, of alienation that we all live with. And it will remain with us, you know, the story of Scripture is such that it will remain with us. God will continue to pursue and will continue to sabotage because it just seems for us at times love is not enough, right? It's like it, there's got to be love plus something else that I can attain. I want to correlate what you just said to what you described as the sympathetic nervous system storm. Right, right. Let's put some legs on that. What does that look like? How does the sympathetic nervous system show, storm show up in our bodies? What does it look like for people? So folks are joining with us today and going, okay, how do I know this is present in my body? What do you say? Yeah. So let me really simplify it. When we talk about the autonomic nervous system, let's just talk about three places, home, storm, and fog. Home corresponds to what is often called the ventral vagal system. This is, this is, uh, this is the the you that experiences delight and joy and goodness and connection and flourishing and peace and uh, all the things, all the good things, right? And when, just think about the moments in your own life when uh, you've been at home, perhaps in your own house or in a space that feels really good for you and you, you exhale and there's a sense of, ah, this is it. This is where I belong. This feels so good. What we long for is to live in this spacious home of, of our ventral vagal, uh, uh, the ventral vagal part of our nervous system. This is a place of connection. But uh, because we live in a world that's broken, because we're in relationships that are broken, um, our good survival system will kick in. It will say, watch out. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure you can trust her. I'm not too sure that person's for you. Uh, and and we will kick into the sympathetic storm, our sympathetic nervous system, which is to say our fight, flight, fawn, and find system. Four Fs for me, and people describe these differently, but fight, you know, we'll protect ourselves by lashing out. Flight, we'll protect ourselves by pulling away. Fawn, we'll protect ourselves through some form of appeasement or negotiation. And find, we'll chase after the love that we think we need and we'll cling to it for it. And that's, that's a place that a lot of our a lot of us find ourselves in. We live in this kind of um, pervasive and perpetual storm, feeling like we just have to survive life rather than really thriving in life, living out of that centered place of home where we experience flourishing and shalom. There's one other place, though, that I call fog. And this corresponds to another part of the parasympathetic nervous system that is, is sort of your uh, last survival system. It's your most primitive system. And what it's there for is to shut it all down when things get too overwhelming. 
And so in, in those moments, what our, what our system does is, uh, it, it sort of turns off, uh, it turns off the energy and we find ourselves in bed. You know, I, I remember a, a season that I was in where I just, I felt like I couldn't get out of bed. And it was like, where, where, I didn't know it at the time, but it was like, where was all that sympathetic storm energy that was getting through my work days? And the reality is my body was saying, no more, you can't do it. Uh, at one point, about 12 years ago, I landed in a Mexican hospital, uh, uh, for an emergency surgery, had to have my gallbladder out. But what they realized was that my system was septic. And it was like my body was saying, no more. We're going to shut you down. You can't continue at this pace. And that's where we talk about freeze and fold. Our bodies go into these states of, of intense self-protection. And, and we weren't designed, the, the, we, those were designed for, for particular situations, but we weren't designed to live there, if that makes sense. Uh, we go into these disconnected states uh, temporarily because we're in danger. You know that I, I, I like to. I, I need to be in sympathetic if a car is coming at me in an intersection and I need to turn real quick, right? But if I'm in that mode where I'm grasping hold of my steering wheel 24 hours a day, my body is going to keep the score. And so that's that's just sort of a basic home storm and fog is sort of a basic way of talking about. Um, the ways in which we get disconnected. So what do we do then with the seething rage about injustice, the bitterness, yeah. the senses of betrayal, the sleepless nights? Yeah. The reason I ask is because 20 years ago was a major inflection point in your life. Talk mm -hmm. about how to, how to negotiate with and navigate through yeah. these experiences. In fact, I'll just be candid and say this time last year, I was right in it. I was right yeah. in the middle of exactly that, the rage, yeah. the betrayal, the sleepless nights, yeah. and uh, it collapsed my immune system later in the year. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing about our, our nervous system is that um, it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't work on morality. It doesn't work on good and bad. It's It just simply works on connection and disconnection. Am I thriving or surviving? And so it doesn't ask, is this good or bad? It's like, let's just get out of here. Um, this isn't helpful. And so we're the ones who sort of impose a sense of morality onto it. Now, the reason I say that is uh, you asked this question about injustice. And I experienced something uh, a little over 20 years ago where I was fired from a church. It was a really tough situation where it felt like injustice. And I, I did go into a bit of fight mode. Like I wanted to make the pastor who fired me pay. I remember thinking about doing different kinds of things, particular kinds of things to, to make him pay. Now I was, I was in fight mode. Fight mode isn't bad. It was just, it was helping me survive during that time. Um, I would say that the real pursuit of justice is, is when we've shifted back into home, that home state, uh, you know, where the windows are open and the air is coming in and the sun is shining and we're experiencing flourishing and we can access some of that fight energy to say, okay, so now what do I want to do to pursue justice? Notice now I'm, I'm acting from a centered and grounded place versus a more reactive place. I was in a very reactive place 21 years ago and probably for the years after I was probably in a, in a, in a sort of ping pong match of fight and flight. Uh, but when I found my way back to center, I was able to say, okay, so now what do I really want? What do I really need? What would justice look like? And I think the most, uh, 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 there's a new book by Judith Herman uh, out about this right now. Um, uh, Truth and Repair, I think is what it's called. I'm blanking on, on the actual name of it. But uh, she's, one of the, she's one of the giants of, of um, our understanding of trauma. Goes, she goes all the way back to, uh, you know, early Bessel van der Kock years. And what she says is that justice um, can only be formulated by the survivor. In other words, when we when we find ourselves to that place of, okay, so now I'm connected, I'm healthy again, and I do this work with people who've been wronged. You know, n n now I say, so what would justice look like for you? And now it's not coming out of a reactive place; it's coming out of a much more grounded place. Uh, and and from there, well, we can make some decisions that might be healthy or helpful. Wow. Okay. So how do we? How do we get to that place when we're let's just create a case study for folks yeah. when we are in the place of like in my case last year, it felt like deep, unexpected betrayal mm. and then 
when my nervous system says, oh, it's betrayal, then there's this downstream effect for all the mm. other feelings. Like, yeah. if I see a certain person, I'm not sure he's going to be alive in 10 minutes. I, yes. I mean, I'm not yes. that per Chuck, I'm not that person. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, having, yeah. I'm having thoughts and emotions I've never had in my life. Yeah, yeah. How do we, how do we begin to get to yeah. where we're using, as you said, fight energy yeah. in a more positive, life-giving way? And to even quote yeah. D Judith, she said, what was Judith's quote again? She said about, about the person who... Yeah, she says it's uh, justice is, is for the survivor to decide. We can't have That's some it. sort of arbitrary sense of justice. It's something that comes as the survivor does the deep work and gets connected to what she really needs or he really needs, right? And so it's from that place that we, we have the clarity to make the, the decision. Yeah, so, so take us into, let's just build a case study. Yeah. The betrayal happens... The yep. rage is there. The sleepless nights yeah. are present. I can't just, at least I couldn't, maybe that yeah. was a lack of tools in my toolbox. I couldn't yeah. say, okay, today I'm going to decide to redirect this energy toward, yeah. how do we get there, Chuck? Yeah. I know it's not an overnight thing. Transformation, yeah, as I right. say to folks here, transformation is not uh, a one-day experience. It's a daily experience. Yeah. yeah. So so with what you're talking about, you know, there's there's an a stressor. There's something that's happening in, in, in a person's life. It's situational, right? That's creating some sort of significant stress. And what we know about uh, uh, abuse, uh, stress, and trauma is that um, it will grow and fester within us. Trauma will grow and fester within us if we're alone. We can't be alone in it. Um, uh, uh, the, the great uh, physician physician and trauma expert Gabor Mate says trauma is not what happens to you but what happens within you in the absence of a compassionate witness and so number one we need a compassionate witness you can't do it alone so that's the first thing I'd say is there's this tendency that we have and this goes back to Genesis 3 as well to go it on our own and that will only lead to further trauma and what I'd say is for me 21 years ago I had this sense that no one really gets it even the people in my life who I thought would get it are sort of patronizing me. They're sort of saying, oh, you're so resilient, Chuck. We're so proud of you for how you've survived this. They didn't really understand how it had impacted me. So I sort of went inside and I said, they're not going to be helpful. I, I'm on my own here. And that leads to further trauma. So that's number one. We need we need a compassionate witness. You need, and I don't know what it was like for you a year ago, but you know, it took me landing in a Mexican hospital. That might be number two, right? We need to we need to begin to pay attention to the impact of it in our bodies. And I, uh, y you may know this from from uh, this book, but uh, I talk about this dashboard that we need to pay attention to, this personal dashboard that. Uh, gives us a kind of a, a, a front seat view of what's going on underneath the hood in the engine of our autonomic nervous system, which is to say we need to pay attention to our thoughts, our feelings, our body, our behaviors, and our relationships. And as we start to pay attention, we, we realize, oh, my thoughts, I'm really judgment. I keep thinking about how I'm going to get back at that person. Um, my emotions, goodness, I'm, I'm feeling constantly angry and overwhelmed my my body uh i'm tensed up so much these days i can feel my neck and in my jaw and my shoulders and my and my behavior you know i'm wow i'm drinking a whole lot more at night and then i'm uh, caffing up in the morning you know with four or five cups of coffee my interpersonal relationships i pulled away from everyone it's sort of like me against the world and when you begin to Notice these behaviors. I'll have people that I work with write these things down with either a yellow or a red pen or, or some sort of indicator, which is to say yellow caution or red emergency, you know? And if, if, if I get two or three reds, we know that we, uh, we really need to home in, right? But this gives us a state of, okay, so what's going on? How, it's, how is it impacting you? And what I want to say about that is that alone, that process of, of, um, better understanding yourself, bearing witness to what's going on inside of you, and doing that in the presence of another. Uh, and our friends Kurt and Allison would say the same thing, that that in and of itself is healing. That's the very beginning of it. Uh, because it's when we disconnect, it's when we go away, it's when we're alienated from ourselves that, that it gets worse, that trauma festers. But as we begin to pay attention, 
um, notice what's going on as others join us in that work, the healing work begins. I think there's a thesis sort of coming out of what you just shared with us. It's straight away your words. In our effort to pursue justice for what happened to us, we begin to hinder any chance at healing what's within. Pull the mm-hmm. thread on that. Yeah, so I I think oftentimes, and we're seeing this more and more on social media. I mean, thank the Lord I wasn't on social media back in uh, 2003. I don't, maybe MySpace was around back then, right? But, you know, I think with the proliferation of these places that can be really helpful, um, uh, because we need to be seen, because we need to be known, um, because we want to tell our story, uh, we do find ourselves perhaps um, reacting before reflecting, uh, which is to say, uh, we, uh, Twitter becomes our therapy, <laughs> Facebook becomes our therapy, Instagram becomes our therapy, rather than that embodied space, that spiritual director, that therapist, that good friend, that mentor, that pastor sitting with us saying, let's tease this out. Um, uh, X, Twitter, uh, Instagram, thread, they're not going to care for your soul. <laughs> they're going to give you a space to say something and, you know, however many characters you get to say it in, but they're not going to tend to the wounds of your soul. And I, and I, I think that uh, part of this is noticing, I'd, I'd ask people to notice in their bodies, am I feeling more like I'm in a reactive place or a reflective place? Reactive being, I, I, need, I need to do something about this right now. I need justice right now. My fists right now, if people are listening, are clenched and my teeth are clenched and I'm like, Ugh, I need it right now versus reflection. Wow, that hurt. And I'm, I'm mad and I'm sad. And um, I want justice, but I think as I'm sitting with my therapist or my friend right now, I'm sensing that I'm probably going to need to do a little bit of healing before I can have that hard conversation with my, you know, my, my spouse or my former boss or that person who betrayed me. And that's a very different posture. Uh, that's a very different internal state to be in. A good friend of mine, mentor of mine, he's probably my, my most repeated guest on the show. Jamie Winship is his name. And Jamie okay. talks in the... Uh, framework of shame is manifesting as self-protection, self-promotion. Yes. And he often shares how forgiveness and the the, the asset and tool of forgiveness can help Hmm. break down those those internal narratives and those reflexes. Again, I don't want to jump to the punchline too quickly, but I'd love your initial take on the power of forgiveness Hmm. and sometimes how we even need to forgive ourselves for yeah. betraying ourselves in yeah. the middle of pain. Yeah. Well, I think to get back to your friend's understanding of shame, I mean, I think shame grows in um, the absence of uh, forgiveness and the absence of um, real reconciliation and connection, right? And so shame grows when we, um, when we disown it and we cope in ways that keep us from feeling shame, right? And so uh, instead of feeling shame, I'm just going to, I'm going to drink too much tonight. Instead of feeling shame, I'm just going to seethe in anger. Well, uh, this is why your friend calls it self-protection, right? We're living in a disconnected, self-protected state at that point, because we don't want to feel, uh, the deficiency, the not enoughness, uh, the alienation that comes with shame. So there's in forgiveness, there's a kind of surrender. Like I can't do this on my own anymore. Um, I may not be able to reconcile with this person, but I need to relinquish justice on my own terms. Now, I can still want justice. I can still ask for justice. But what forgiveness gets at is I'm I'm going to release you from my grip, from my wrath, you know. Um, And... And, uh, well, in time I may choose to, you know, I may set a boundary now in time. I may choose to pursue relationship with you. Um, but for now, um, I forgive you, uh, which is to say, um, I release you, uh, from my wrath. (laughs) That's one way of talking about there. There are other ways of talking about forgiveness too. Uh, but that's one way of talking about it. Hmm. I want to jump back to the nervous system. Love maybe some flyover principles on healing the nervous system, partnering with the nervous yeah. system. Um, are you familiar with Stephen Porges, like polyvagal theory and all that? I, yeah. Yeah, I just love your flyover take on all of that. How do we partner with the nervous system yeah. uh, to heal? 
So, so what I just gave you earlier, home, storm, and fog, is polyvagal um, uh, simplified, you know, because I think sometimes it, I don't know about you, but when I hear words like ventral and sympathetic and dorsal, my brain starts spinning. Uh, um, and so, so uh, the, the real simplified version of this is, and I'll, I'll give you a, sort of a, a picture of how I do this with folks. I'll, I'll do these five-day, 15-hour intensives, uh, oftentimes with leaders and pastors uh, who come to my office and uh, after a couple of days of, of, of doing a bit of, of diagnosing together, of getting a sense of the story and what's going on within, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll draw this, this kind of circle on the board and I'll just kind of go like, if people are listening, I'm just kind of, I'm circling my hand, which is to say I'm drawing a picture of a storm on the board and I'm saying that's the state of your soul right now. And that's usually when people start to cry. <laughs> you know, like you're living in a storm. And uh, that's not a fun place to live. It feels a little bit like you're um, you're trapped on a hamster wheel, and and you're afraid that if you get off, um, it'll all shut down. You'll lose, you know, you lose the people, the the job, whatever, whatever you're keeping close to you by living in storm. And I'll say this is your sympathetic nervous system. This has helped you survive, and I bet you've been on this hamster wheel for a long, long time. Let's talk about that. And uh, we'll, we'll notice that, yeah, well, actually, wow, I can trace that all the way back in my life. It seems that I had to get on that because, you know, dad was gone a lot. Mom demanded a lot of me. And I had to perform. And goodness, you know, I was on the academic honor roll, and I was, you know, top person on my team. And I've been on the hamster wheel for a long, long time time. I thought this was normal. Uh, so that's, that's your sympathetic nervous system um, now operating in a way that uh, has gone beyond survival. You've been living there for a long time and, and now you're sort of stuck. We use that word habituated earlier, right? You're almost addicted um, to this kind of adrenal, adrenaline and cortisol high each day. And and so now to get it healing, we've got to ask ourselves the question. It's more complicated than this, obviously. There are more dimensions to the nervous system. I sort of started mentioning those earlier. Uh, but we've got to begin to imagine what it would like be like for us to shift from this stormy state. And this is where the metaphors are really helpful because none of us likes to stand outside in a storm. Shift from this hurricane that we're living in to the still waters of God to a place of rest and delight. And, um, and we'll, we'll do some work around that. I'll, I'll maybe invite them to start breathing in a particular way um, or cross their chest with their arms and start tapping uh, through breathing and through tapping and through other practices. We'll do some prayer practices where we breathe in and we breathe out. They'll start to be like, they'll say to me, the first thing they'll say to me is, I don't think I've breathed in 20 years. Like it feels so strange to um, inhale and exhale in the way that you're inviting me to. The second thing they'll say is, I'm really scared to get off the hamster wheel because if I get off, uh, my church isn't going to want me to be their pastor anymore. Um, my husband's not going to want to be married to me anymore. I'm really scared. So it's really important to honor the complexities of the healing journey. But but what ends up happening is they, as they begin to embody this and practice this in, in ways that I, I get into a bit in the book, um, they begin to say, oh, yeah, this feels so much better. I mean, just in the last three months, I've worked with a, a number of pastors in these five-day intenses. I'm getting texts from them saying, I didn't know it was possible to live in a state where I'd feel calm and centered and clear and present and grounded and... Um, having access to my emotions and being able to choose what I want to put in my body and not and uh, you know walking or running each day uh, engaging my bodies in ways that are that are healthy and not self-sabotaging it's simply a shift in states from storm to home I don't want to simplify it it's not simple at all um, because there's a lot of resistance within us as this shift begins to happen um, but but it is this movement uh, as we think about it through polyvagal theory, from danger to safety, from disconnection to connection. We've touched on this a few times already today, and I'd love to know your thoughts on the relationship between disconnection mm -hmm. and the manifestation of autoimmune disease in the body. I even have told folks in the last little bit of time, uh, self-hatred is like autoimmune disease of the soul. I'm really fascinated yeah. by this connection. I've considered it for a few years. 
it's been my personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love your take on this because the yeah, body so definitely tells a story. Yeah, the body tells the story. The body keeps the score. <laughs> I would um, right. perhaps you've heard of the um, the Vancouver based physician Gabor Mate. Oh, I mentioned his name absolutely. earlier. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I I'd encourage I, because I'm not a physician, um, but I've I've benefited from the research of physicians like Gabor Mate and others. I'd encourage everyone to to listen to a podcast by Gabor Mate to pick up his book, The Myth of Normal. The connections, the research based connections between. Um, us, what I just talked about, us living in this sympathetic storm or this dorsal fog where we shut down and um, autoimmune disease, uh, all manner of disease, right? Um, uh, cancer, respiratory illness, allergies, all kinds of things uh, is significant. And, and uh, what research is showing is that when we live in, in those states, our bodies are inflamed, um, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we find ourselves um, it's sort of like illness compounds, right? Illness upon illness upon illness. And we start treating the symptoms without ever getting to the cause. Uh, we're, we're looking at this now, not we, I'm, I'm not one of the researchers, right? But people are looking at this now generationally. They're looking at for different groups of people. If you're, um, if you're African-American in America, if you're a woman in America, how has trauma impacted you uniquely as your agency has been taken away from you? But we're seeing that trauma impacts all of us, right? And so um, if you've got some sort of story in which you've been carrying around um, this traumatic pain festering within you, coping in particular kinds of ways, uh, chances are there will be physical manifestations of some kind that you've been trying to treat and medicate uh, either on your own, self-medicating through too much drugs or alcohol or other things like that, um, or through merely uh, addressing symptoms uh, with your doctor, but never really getting to the core. Well, I've been yeah. in the process of forgiving myself. We touched on forgiveness moments ago, but I've been in a process of forgiving myself for betraying myself. And Ooh. folks, I know you're gonna resonate with this, and Chuck for gaslighting myself yeah, at yeah. critical points of loss and pain. Yeah. Yeah. Even as I said, within the last year, I, I remember yeah. it was not a conscious thing. It was a subconscious motivation like, dude, just get over it. And, and I gaslit yeah. myself. Yeah. I'd love your take on the need to reconcile with ourselves in yeah. context of the conversation around disconnection. Yeah, I, I think that phrase gaslighting yourself is a really important one. My previous book was on narcissism in the church and talked a lot about the kind of gaslighting that you get from narcissists in that space. But the reality is if you get out of the, the problematic system or the problematic relationship or the problematic and dysfunctional family and you're left with you, uh, you're left with uh, the voices within you. And there are lots of different voices within us that we need to attend to. You know, there's the, the, the perfectionist voice. You're just, um, you're not doing it well enough if you just try harder. Um, there's the, um, you know, if you just, uh, um, you know, if, if, if you just uh, reconcile, it'd be better. There, there are the voices that say if you just power up and the voices that say if you power down, the, part, the voices that shame you. It, part of it is, uh, in one of the chapters, I use the movie Inside Out. I didn't even know there was an Inside Out 2 coming, but... I talk about listening to these various voices within us that actually have a lot to say if we start paying attention. Um, these are voices, by the way, that aren't bad. They're not trying to hurt us. Um, they're just trying to survive. And part of the, the work of uh, building back toward um, reconnection amidst self-alienation is doing this work of listening in to our stories, to the voices within. Um, I've I, one of the things I realized early on in my journey that has accompanied me and I've had to continue to, to, to sort of revisit it um, are the voices of young parts of me that uh, if I go way back in my story will whisper to me, you'll always be alone. Um, and so I've got a really young part of me that says we're, we're alone. We'll always be alone. I've got another part of me that jumps in the driver's seat and says, uh, well, uh, forget about that. If we're going to be alone, I'm just I'm going to drive this ship, and I'm just going to plow through anyone um, that uh, you know that tries to get in my way, uh, and every voice in between, you know. And so we start listening in. We realize that there are a whole wide range of voices. There's a whole uh, inner dialogue that, as we as we listen and pay attention, we can begin to, as I say, befriend these voices, these parts of us that uh, carry around our pain. 
Yeah, I want to get to befriending our pain. I know that's a huge thing yeah. in your ministry. I want to get to that yeah. in a moment, but I want to sort of back up from the uh, yeah. gaslighting of ourselves. I want to ask this. Self-hatred shows up in our lives how? Perhaps in a way we wouldn't quickly identify. What do you see in the clients that walk into your office? What I, what I often see with self-hatred, self-contempt, is that it's a really old voice inside of them. They'll come to me and they'll say, um, yeah, I just had this bad experience with my coworker and um, I'm so mad at her. We'll get down into it. I'm so mad at myself for not saying more. And that so mad at myself, if we trace it back, what we realize is that I'm so mad at myself uh, that um, I didn't speak up in my family when my dad was abusing my older sister. <laughs> Uh, what ends up happening is we, we trace that voice back to earlier parts of our lives and our stories uh, that are really important and really powerful. And we realize we, we carry around um, these, these, these sort of um, experiences of the past in the present, and they show up in our present day uh, relationships, they show up at work. Um, and so you know, part of the work is noticing in the first place, what is that, what is that voice saying, that voice of self-hatred, that voice of self-contempt? Uh, you don't matter. You don't belong. You'll never matter. And then we'll sort of gently walk with curiosity into the story. Like, where have you heard that voice before? Well, I, gosh, I think I've always heard some version of I don't matter. You know, my dad, my dad told me I didn't matter when he left when I was four years old, you know. So I've carried around that ever since. Well, how, what, what have you tried? How, how have you worked with that voice within you? Well, I've just gotten busy. I've, I've tried to matter. I've climbed the ladder at work. Um, I've become the best salesman at my company. Um, I, I got the award in the, in, 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 in the program I went through. Whatever it might be, you know, I've just tried to quell that voice within me. Well, you can't quell it. As you know, uh, you've got to listen. So how do we befriend our pain then, Chuck? How do you do it? You listen. Perhaps listen yeah. is part of befriending our pain, but I'm curious. Yeah. So, I mean... I, I do this work as a therapist and as a spiritual director, and, and I don't want to in any way uh, say, say that this is easy work, right? But oftentimes as people um, begin to lean in and listen, it, it can be really emotional, right? It can be like, oh, goodness, I've carried this around for a long, long time. And they'll discover that these, um, you know, these voices within um, are parts of them that uh, have, have, have been with them for a long time. And as we listen, we'll, we'll often hear, we'll see with these various parts of us, maybe an image. Um, you know, he, this part of me feels like a bully inside of me, and he's got this very big looming presence. Or what I'm seeing inside is a little boy, and he's sort of off to the side, and he's in the fetal position, and he's, he's saying, I don't matter, just leave me alone, you know. And oftentimes my clients will get a very, sometimes a very visual sort of representation of this part of them. Uh, an emotion, a very strong emotion that will come, uh, you know, a, a deep feeling of sadness or confusion or over, overwhelm or whatever it might be. They, they, might, um, they might get a story. A story might come back to them. Uh, but what we're doing is we're, we're taking what comes. I'm not trying to force anything. Um, we're just listening, uh, watching with curiosity and noticing what comes up. And what's surprising, Chris, and I think probably you know this from your own work, I mean, I've worked with men because of my work on narcissism in the church. I've worked with a lot of grandiose men, grandiose pastors. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. I was working with a man who was large physically and, you know, emotionally. Uh, he was a grandiose man. He was probably 6'5". He was uh, this towering figure. He'd come into my office. His wife was probably 5'2". And... Uh, We've been working together for a few days. His wife was small and diminutive and fearful and living in self-protection. And he came in for our third day, and he started doing what he had done uh, each of the previous two days, um, sort of prosecuting his case against his wife uh, in a very loud tone. And what I said to him, um, and it just gets at what we're talking about, I, I said, I wonder if that prosecutor in you is exhausted yet. I tried to say it in a really kind way. Um, that prosecutor must be exhausted. And he looked at me at first kind of strangely. And, and he said, yeah, he is exhausted. He's so tired of prosecuting his case. He was suddenly talking about a part of him. And I said to him, um, let's call him John. John, that's not the core of you. 
but there's some dynamic inside you that's been around for a long, long time where you felt like in whatever setting you're in, including your marriage, like you've got to prosecute a case. And that's so wearying. Do you want to live like that still? And he starts to weep. And he's like, I'm so tired of living like this. And he looks at his wife and she's like, I'm so tired of, of this in our marriage, you know? And it began this work. Well, you know, what he had done is functionally kind of get a sense that, you know, there's this part that has been large and in charge for a long time within him that beats himself up, that beats others up, that pros- prosecutes a case, that alienates his staff members at church, uh, alienates his family at home. And he realized, I don't have to live like that anymore. But this guy's just been trying to help me survive for a long, long time. I had no intention of going here in the conversation, but I do want to stay here. It's, yeah. really, it's really fascinating because of your work in uh, narcissism. and um, Yeah. Because m- most people don't wake up and decide to blow up their lives. Yeah. Will you, Chuck, will you unpack the anatomy of a moral collapse? We are seeing it, I yeah. feel like, every week right now. One of the largest churches in mm-hmm. North America right now is going through a firestorm of yeah. the same thing. What's yeah. underneath and what's in the, the guts of the anatomy of a moral collapse? How does it, how does yeah. it break down? I mean, I've been in those situations now for 25 years and um, walked alongside pastors. And oftentimes, you know, all, let's just say the dynamics that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes are at work. Um, it's a person living in disconnection, perhaps in a way that looks really spiritual, but they're living in sympathetic activation. When you're living in this sympathetic storm, you're, I want people to get this really clearly. You are, you, you're living and disconnected. You might be winsome. You might be charming. You might be, um, uh, you, you might be socially, you might be pretty good. People might find you to be pretty compelling and engaging, but you're living in disconnection. And it's like a balloon that uh, is expanding, almost ready to burst, right? It, it's like um, you're putting more and more pressure on your nervous system. And when you're living like that, with that tension inside, because we're, we're talking about the nervous system, with that tension inside, we got to cope in ways that ease that tension. And so what they begin to do is they find, they find ways of coping that allow them to get just a little bit of relief. And that way of coping might, might be a few glasses of wine at night. That way of coping may be um, an emotional af- affair with an employee or sexually abusing a child. Or, um, but there are these ways of acting out that, um, uh, that they're, you know, this, this is the anatomy of a moral collapse, right, that they're eventually caught in. And, and people will invariably say, well, I, how did that happen? Never would have expected that from him. And what you don't see is that invisible engine of the autonomic nervous system working underneath. What you get is the the guy on the hamster wheel who looks and dresses the part and um, who seems charming and charismatic, but inside is is running on empty. Hmm. Thanks for going there with me, Chuck. I, I hate to hear about it, and yet... I'm self-aware enough to realize that none of us are immune from the temptation to go down that road. I'm not impervious from anything like that. And I think maybe another conversation, if if you have the interest down the road on the podcast, would be, okay, let's break down uh, healing after moral collapse. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't have time to go here today, but I'd love to hear about the the dark night of the soul, but I want to land the plane here today in just respect of your time. Um, Generational wounds and generational trauma hold people stuck in their bodies. Unpack ancestral (coughs) and generational wounds and how they affect us. Yeah, for for some listeners, um, this is new. I was just talking to some folks, uh, in fact, a couple hours ago who have been doing Enneagram work for years and years, and they've just discovered intergenerational trauma. And, uh, you know, when we talk about generational trauma, we're talking about um, the wounds of, you know, grandma, great-grandma, great-grandpa visiting you on your shores. Like, so the echoes, you know, the waves from afar or the waves from a distance, right? Imagine a wave from from a ship out at sea. That's The the ship is your great-grandpa, your great-grandpa who was in the, I don't know, some war that many years ago and experienced profound trauma and a wave reaching your shores many, many years later. Uh, Now there's a, we could talk about the science behind it. Uh, 
we're not going to talk about epigenetics right now, but uh, what what we'll say is that um, when we live in patterns of disconnection, which is to say, once again, when we live unhealthy, uh, when we live uh, uh, disconnected from relationships, um, when we're not living from a place of center, grounding, flourishing, um, our our bodies will. Uh, let's just say they'll they'll tap into these old schemas, you know, that may go back generations, um, and uh, we we will we will find ourselves de- uh, dealing with a symptom that sounds a lot like a symptom that Grandma dealt with. But I didn't live with Grandma. I didn't know Grandma. Grandma died before, you know, before I was even born. Um, but Grandma had those headaches, and we hear this from our clients. Um, all the time. I didn't know that grandma had headaches like that. Um, I didn't know that, uh, you know, uh, that these allergies that I'm having are the same kinds of allergies that my uh, great uncle had. And so it's, it's kind of a mystery, intergenerational trauma. But what we're realizing is that um, our stories are more complex than we thought. And um, one of the reasons this is important, I think, um, Chris, is I think that sometimes when you get into therapy, it's sort of like this. You, you you go to therapy and you think, you know, maybe in two or three sessions, I'll be able to unpack what's going on inside me and I'll find the smoking gun. I'll find that thing that happened to me. And if I find that thing that happened to me, it, it will resolve. And mm-hmm. what I like to say is, and this, this is the way I was trained 25 years ago, is like, we're going to go back into a person's story and we're going to find the pain point and we're going to kind of resolve it through some catharsis and then we're going to move on with our lives. And that's, that's a really oversimplified way of talking about it. But what I, what I often say is it's just far more complicated than that. There, there are the things that you're going to discover about what happened to you. Uh, there are the things that you're going to continue to try to, I'm almost 54 now. I'm sure I'm going to continue this journey and there are going to be things that I unpack over the next 20 or 30 years, but there are going to be the things that you never know the waves from, you know, another shoreline uh, or something that happened, you know, two or three generations ago that will, uh, that may confuse or perplex. And so there, there is a sense here in which, uh, 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 and I hate to say this because we, we want to think I'm, I'm going to go to therapy and I'm going to find some sense of control, but there is some sense that there's a mystery to you and to your story, and that's okay. Um, I, I have this little exercise that I'll do in, on retreats where we'll light three candles, the first candle for what we know in our stories, the second for what we'll discover, and the third, uh, one which we need to surrender, what we'll never know. Um, and and uh, we're living in a time, this, this sort of time with all this self-help work out there that gives us this, um, this sense that we'll, we'll be able to control it, we'll be able to figure it out, we'll be able to fix ourselves. And I know that you think that that's a myth. I think that's a myth. We don't Completely. fix ourselves. There's no three right. steps or seven steps to a perfect life. <laughs> um, but right. we can move toward connection. Um, I may never know why I continue to struggle with panic attacks. I can invite others into it. Uh, my friends, Kurt or Allison or maybe Chris, or I can invite friends into it and I don't have to do life alone. I can do life more vulnerably. Well, guess what? That's an antidote to shame. And so now I'm going to be able to live in a way where I'm a bit more free from parts of me and my story that are, are more shame based. And on we go on a path of health um, headed toward home within. Headed toward home within. What a great period on the sentence of this conversation, Chuck. I'm so thankful. I just got to add this quickly. I wonder, with generational trauma and such, yeah, how much of that is related to like quantum? And like in the, the quantum, quantum level? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I've read enough to be dangerous in this area. <laughs> Me um, too. <laughs> I I. I, I I think that's the mystery that we're talking about. Um, I think what you're what you're hinting at, um, we're only beginning to understand. But there are connections that are um, that are too um, uh, uh, too significant to ignore. Let's just say, right? That when there are things that happen to people in two different places, you know, across the planet, you know. Uh, in prayer and things like that, that we we know that there's an impact happening at a quantum level, but we can't really put words to exactly how that dynamic is happening. So he, here's the thing about all this. Um, you and I know, know enough to be dangerous. In the next 10, 
20 years, we're going to learn a lot more about the brain. We're going to learn a lot more about the quantum level. Um, I think within the next 10 or 20 years, people are probably going to have more access to things like psychedelics. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as a part of the conversation that we haven't talked about, but uh, I, I tell, you know, I train pastors. And so I'm telling pastors nowadays, your people are going to be saying to you, I'm experiencing God more deeply on a psychedelic retreat than I am at church, you know? And so um, I'm not trying to put the fear of God into into your listeners. I'm trying to say there's a lot we're going to learn and discover about our bodies and brains in the next 10 to 20 years that will, well, literally blow our minds. And um, I'm hopeful about that. I, uh, I I can tend to be a bit fearful, but I'm, I'm hopeful about what we'll learn and how that will allow us to sort of unlock uh, even more of, of the trauma that binds us and keeps us in disease and illness and pathology and things like that. But it, it's going to come with some bumps in the road, too. There's no doubt about that, Chuck. I, I've loved this conversation. We've gone all over the map, and in many we ways, have, I think we've we? just scratched the surface. I think I could do yeah, three right. hours with you, no problem. Um, yeah. Anything else today in, in today's conversation? I would love to have you back on the show uh, in yeah. the fall, and uh, yeah. let's see if we can take a, a, a second-level conversation to this. Yeah. But anything else today, Chuck? Yeah, I mean, I, I think all I'd say is – uh, we, there are a lot of words today, but I think uh, if if someone's listening right now, and, and, uh, and this could be the case sometimes for me as I listen to podcasts like this, and I'm like, oh, goodness, there's a lot there. What do I do with this? Um, the temptation is to buy one of the books that we talked about or listen to another podcast, but I just encourage the listener to put their hand on their chest or on their heart, breathe in through their nose, hold for four seconds, um, Breathe out, exhaling like you're fogging up a window in front of you. And repeat that for a little while. Just get reconnected to their bodies. Uh, even even life-giving conversations can lead us into places of disconnection or up into our heads where it's like, I want to figure this out more. I want to trace that word that Chuck just mentioned or that thing that Chris just said. I would invite people to just get connected to their bodies and begin the work of reconnection right here and right now. So good. Um, Chuck, listen, I would love for folks to stay connected to your work. We're going to put links in the show notes to everything we've mentioned today from Judith Herman's book to Gabor Mate's book to all of your work. But uh, yeah, I'd love for people to stay connected to you. Tell us how to do that. Yeah, so I'm at www.chuckdegroat.net. That's D-E-G-R-O-A-T. And then on the socials, it's at Chuck DeGroat. So whether it's X or Instagram or Facebook or, you know, uh, not TikTok, sorry. Uh, but yeah. you can find me there. Yeah. Awesome. Chuck, thank you for being here today. What a joy. What a gift. Yeah, yeah I feel like I made a new friend. So good to, to connect I, with you, Chris. Likewise. Yeah, likewise. 